So I've been asked to talk about Ray Patricola's support, but I sort of feel like I'm talking about fried chicken in, this, in uh, front of Colonel Sanders because Naveen Kapoor has really done all this work, and so he should give the talk. And, um, but nonetheless, I'll do my best. Um, I am on the Speaker's Bureau for Abby, and that is my relevant disclosure. So I think it's always good to put it in perspective to the real world. Let's talk about a patient here not that long ago, 68-year-old female, comes in with some chest pain, You've seen this before, right? Syncope in the ER, hypotension. Syncope before arrival, hypotension in the ER, inferior ST elevation. Start her on some pressors. You take her to the cath lab. She's got 100% proximal, right? EF on a ventricular gram is really low. She gets reperfused with a nice DES to the right. And the impeller gets put in at the end of the procedure. Swan Gantz catheter gets placed. She gets to the CCU, and they try and wean the dopa, and they are unable. So... What do they do good here? What do they do well? Well, there's data that if you use a lot of impellas in um, acute MI and shock, there are better outcomes. So I think they did the right thing by putting the impella. There's also some good data that hemodynamic support improves outcomes, probably because you make adjustments before clinical things. You probably see things earlier. So they did that well. And uh, they tried to wean the dopamine. They also did that well because there's data that the more presses you're on, the worse you do. And there are a lot of good theoretical reasons why, right? It increases your heart rate, increases your myocardial oxygen demand, all these things. So why did this patient not come off the dopamine? Well, there's two reasons. Either their LV was bad, right? Their EF was 25 or in this case, their right ventricle was involved in the infarct, right? So a lot of reasons for right ventricular failure. Happens after LVAD, after transplant, after sternotomy. Uh, But the one we're talking about here is in the setting of acute myocardial infarction, right? A relatively small percentage of acute myocardial infarction. But if you look at those in cardiogenic shock, the incidence of right ventricular dysfunction is much higher either as a result of the shock, right, because, again, the left ventricle fails, pulmonary venous pressure goes up, pulmonary artery pressure goes up, strain on the RV goes up, or because of a primary RV problem, right? They have RV involvement of an inferior myocardial infarction. So, but if you look at the Recover Right which study, which we'll get to in a second, and their definition of RV dysfunction, it's pretty high when you're in shock. And, of course, what are the consequences of right ventricular failure? I mean, there's no doubt that they don't do well. The mortality is high, they're in the ICU longer, they go into renal failure, and of course after LVADs, worse outcome uh, with LVADs and transplants. And there's some data that if you get RV support earlier, you can improve survival, at least in the uh, LVAD world. Uh, so there's, how do you measure RV dysfunction? What's the definition? Well, there's a ton of ways to do it. There are non-invasive ways and there are invasive ways. You can look at S prime, you can look at TAPSI, you can look at size of the RA, size of the right sided chambers. Um, and then there are hemodynamic ones. And a couple, of, there's the CVP, there's the elevated CVP, there's the CVP to wage ratio. And then I'm going to um, really just highlight the pulmonary artery uh, pulsatile index, which is what I think everybody should be uh, using. And I think this is great work by Naveen to uh, really bring this to the forefront. And for those of you who don't know what that is, It's essentially the pulse pressure on the right side of the heart, which you see a narrow pulse pressure on the left side, and you're like, that patient's sick. Well, if your pulmonary artery pressure, pulse pressure is low, they're sick on the right side. And so it's the PA systolic minus the diastolic over the right atrial pressure. These are cutoffs. Again, just some simple concepts. These are some cutoffs that have been used to predict right ventricular failure after LVAD. And again, I just want to concentrate on the bottom two ratio of over 0.6, so your CVP is out of proportion to your wedge, or your pulmonary artery pulsatile index, your pulsatility index, your PAPI, less than one. Worked them back in 2012. If you looked at the PAPI and you compared it to RV stroke index, you compared it to that wedge to RA ratio, the most sensitive, the most specific, the one with the greatest predictive value was the pulsatility index. So what are your options for RV support? There's the dual protect, the tandem heart, and then there's the impella RP. And there's some data to suggest that these devices work. The protect, I'm sorry, the um, recover right study, uh, my 
partner, Dr. O'Neill, presented back at TCT in 2014. So you're looking at a couple of years ago, really the first look at the use of the RP impeller, for those of you who don't know, 22 French motor, but an 11 French catheter, goes in from the vein, from the femoral vein on the left. And they looked at potential benefits to this pump for those who had RV. Now look at the bottom here, RV dysfunction. The definition that they used at the time was a cardiac index less than 2.2. We'll, we'll get into what may be a little bit uh, better to use than that. They used CVP over 15 or 16, and they used the ratio, the CVP to a wedge ratio greater than 6. They didn't use uh, Pappy back here. And there were two cohorts. One, of course, if you had trouble after an LVAD. But look on the right, cohort B, post-cardiotomy, uh, post or again, in the setting of acute myocardial infarction. Very hard to enroll. We were one of the centers in the study. Hard to enroll these people. A lot of people got screened and failed. But nonetheless, a few people had the device. And the device works. As you turn up the RPMs, you get more flow. And if you look at measures of cardiac index while they're on support, goes up and it stays up after you take the device out. And if you look at central venous pressure, it goes down while the device is in and it stays down after you remove it. And you can wean pressors. And if you look at outcomes, again, look at the cohort B and you compare it to some historical controls and some benchmark references, there was some evidence that you can improve outcomes with percutaneous support. So in today's day and age, I just want to end on Bill's current project, which is this Detroit Cardiogenic Shock Initiative, which, to put it in its simplest form, is an algorithmic approach to treating shock, concentrating on early support before the PCI, early identification, and early escalation. And to go through it here, if you have a person who's in shock and you get access, before you do the PCI, just put in a venous catheter, put in it, and give some quick measurements. And what you're looking at here is LVDP and a measure of cardiac index. And if the cardiac index is less than 2, CV, the LVDP is high, the pro protocol says put in an impella. Then go ahead and fix the artery, and then make two measurements by your swan at the end of the procedure before you leave the lab. Instead of cardiac index over 2.2, we're just using cardiac power output, which is your mean arterial pressure, times the cardiac output by your FIC, divided by 451 just to get it to watts, and normal should be 1. So you can use cardiac index, or you can use cardiac output, but two simple measurements, cardiac power or cardiac index, and then the poppy. And look down below here, very simple. If your cardiac power output is low, less than 0.6, and your papia is less than 0.9, that tells you you have a right-sided problem that might be the cause of your left-sided problem, so you put in an RV support. Now, if your cardiac output actually is normal, but your papia is still low, you could argue that it hasn't affected anything yet, but you might want to at least consider support. That is the algorithm. And then when you get to the CCU, you use those two parameters to wean these devices. You can wean the right-sided device when your papia is better than 0.9. You can wean the left-sided device when your cardiac power input is now greater than 6. And if they don't get better, then you've got to escalate. And with this algorithm, those two simple measurements in a pilot study, it looks like we can make a dent, finally, in the mortality associated with cardiogenic shock. And in this 50-patient pilot study, very high explant to these devices and survival to discharge. So. The take-home messages here is that RV dysfunction is common in those with cardiogenic shock, and it's bad. And there are simple hemodynamic formulas that can identify these patients and predict worse outcomes, and that the poppy index appears to have the best predictive value for death and need for support. There are fully percutaneous methods to give RV support, and there's some pilot data that suggests Support the RV if your cardiac power output is less than 0.6 and your poppy is less than 0.9. And consider RV support if your cardiac power output is still preserved but your poppy is less than 0.9 nonetheless. Thank you very much.